This podcast is part of the C-Suite Radio Network, turning the volume up on business. Welcome to the Business Power Hour, hosted by Deb Creer. Join us as Deb talks with her guests, experts in their fields, as they share real-life stories and techniques to power up your business. Good morning, good morning. I am Deb Creer, and I am passionate about giving professionals the tools that they need to make themselves and their businesses as successful as possible. And today, we are going to have so much fun because we're talking about technology and not how to build your website, how to do direct mail campaigns, but true technology, the technology that drives everything. And that's part of what we're going to be talking about is technology drives everything. And is that a good thing? You know, are we really getting ourselves in into what is good or are we bordering on some places where we could be causing some problems? So please join me in welcoming my absolutely fascinating guest today, David Ferguson. Welcome, David. Good morning, Deb. It's wonderful to be here with you. Great. Well, let me tell people a little bit about you. So David Ferguson is a corporate finance leader specializing in global mergers and acquisitions. He engages regularly with business, media, political, and academic leaders on the factors influencing corporate growth. He is a pioneer and an international award winner for cross-border investment between the United States and China. Chairman of the finance industry's leading think tank, he is recognized as an expert on the impact of technology on business, government, and humankind. And he just wrote this great book called The Transhuman Code. And we're going to be talking about that today. But again, David, welcome. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of your program, and I'm very much looking forward to being able to engage with you, of course, and, and also to be able to share some insight with all of your listeners. Great. And well, you. thank you. You know, it's, it, it is one of those things. We, we love our technology, right? You know, we can't go anywhere without our cell phones. You know, we're, we're doing all of these things with technology. And, you know, so, so let's talk about the premise of the book. First, you know, what is transhuman? And then let's talk about why you decided to write the book. Sure. Well, the, 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 the term refers to the ability to be able to, to bring the human to the highest possible level. And, okay. and that doesn't mean the addition of technology to the human, although there, there is a, a, a phrase, a, a legacy phrase called transhumanism, which is really the uh, adapt, uh, adapting the human to, to consume technology and be prepared for technology. In our case, um, what we intended was to be able to, to communicate that there's, an, there's tremendous opportunity for humanity at large um, if we manage technology appropriately. Right. Mm -hmm. and maybe, maybe I can share with you the, the origin, uh, the genesis of, uh, of the book. Great. Uh, you, you referenced in your very generous in, uh, introduction my, my background in corporate finance. And five years ago, I was invited to attend the World Economic Forum to, to specifically address how technology is going to be financed. Now, at that time, of the 12 primary industry sectors that, that we in the investment banking community uh, monitor, technology factored around number six in terms of, of total wow. uh, value and, uh, and volume. Mm -hmm. um, I appreciated and I enjoyed very much the ability to be able to in, engage with political leaders, finance, business leaders, um, philanthropic leaders, religious leaders who assemble, 4,000 of them in, in Davos, Switzerland each year at the World Economic Forum. But what became very obvious to me by the fifth day was that the story really wasn't about financing technology. I, I felt quite confident that was going to take care of itself. Mm -hmm. But really what I was witnessing was just how transformative technology was going to be to every other industry mm -hmm. sector. And so um, in the two years ahead, I, I focused my concentration on learning uh, what technologies existed already. And specifically, I'm, I'm talking about the algorithmic technologies. Mm -hmm. So these, these are technologies that are using algorithms uh, for their processing and, and application. Cybersecurity, uh, the Internet of Things, uh, advanced robotics, of course, uh, artificial intelligence. In 2016, 
Um, I returned to Davos uh, for my third year and in a conversation with Tim Berners-Lee, who you may know is the founder of, of the World Wide Web, mm -hmm. and Carlos Moreira, who is my co-author uh, on this book and, and a, a well-respected cybersecurity pioneer, the early stages uh, of data use or data misuse were becoming evident uh, to the industry. It was not yet public knowledge. The New York Times hadn't, hadn't broken the story yet. Um, but we've, what we've come to appreciate now, not only um, from Facebook, but also Amazon and, and Google um, have been challenged and, and, um, uh, and are under formal investigation for using data in ways that is not appropriate. That, um, that became a working, a working title project for us called the Trust Protocol. And in, in a few short months, uh, the story was, uh, was unearthed, the, the headlines were out, and so we didn't feel that it was our charge to, uh, to write that story. But what we did determine was that there would be tremendous value in helping all of us uh, understand what the ramifications would be if technology was not used responsibly. Mm -hmm. So if technology... Um, and humanity together um, didn't put the human first. Right. So we, we use the phrase keeping the human at the center of gravity in, in that relationship. And I'm, I'm sure um, many of your um, viewers and, and listeners will remember the last time that technology got away from us. Mm -hmm. um, it resulted in, uh, in a... In a um, uh, tremendously uh, uh, horrendous uh, act, and this, of course, was the nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think we learned through that experience that, well, we may be able to develop the technology to do something. Um, we have to very, very carefully screen mm -hmm. um, what we do, when we do it, and, and how we do it, and we have to be so cautious of, of what the impact could be. So that was, that was the catalyst uh, for developing the transhuman code. Right. You know, and there's definitely the concept of just because we can, should we? Um, you know, and, 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 you know, let's face it, many of us, we, like I said at the start, we love our technology. I mean, I love the fact that here in Atlanta, I can order something from Amazon and on many things I can get it within an hour or two. You know, we can now order from grocery stores and, and have things delivered. And, you know, and, and there's certainly different ramifications with that, that, you know, now we have people who are, who are becoming antisocial, you know, because they're not going out. Um, you know, we're networking like this. You know, but technology has good things. I mean, like you're in San Francisco, I'm in Atlanta. But, you know, when we're giving, you know, technology all of this information, you know, there is, is obviously security risks. You know, we're giving our social security numbers. We're giving, um, you know, our credit card numbers. You know, all of these various things. And, you know, and it, then what happens? And it, my, you know, just totally anecdotal observation is that, you know, we all think, oh, this is cool. Let's do this. But we don't think, what could that mean in the future? Um, you know, and, and so we do think, well, it's really, really great to be able to order from Amazon in an hour. But that means that Amazon has all of this data about us. Now, I love Amazon. You know, not that I'm bashing Amazon. But, you know, and, and, or Facebook. You know, we give them so much information about ourselves. You know, and, and so that's when we start getting, you know, it, it's funny. I'm obviously a big Facebook user. And, you know, people will complain and they'll say, you know, I was looking at hotels in Rome on my browser. And my Facebook ads started showing, you know, a, a, advertisements for Rome because of cookies, because of all of these various things. And that's, I mean, that, that comes back to the whole big brother thing. You know, are we giving technology too much? And, and of course that what has happened is technology isn't doing this by itself. We gave technology that ability. That's right. <clears throat> yes. Well, um, you know, it, it may be a tired old adage, but, uh, but there isn't a free lunch mm -hmm. maybe applicable here. So the, I, I think you've raised two very important um, questions and, and subjects worthy of discussion. Um, first, firstly, um, yes, uh, we do like, we still like bright, shiny things in the grass, and, and our consumerism is growing. It, it's estimated that 
that um, we in the developed world own um, at least 100% more things than we did a decade ago. Wow. And um, this, this in part is, is due to an, uh, advanced marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in part due to uh, increased production uh, capacities. Mm -hmm. It's due in part to relatively low um, barriers to entry, uh, although you know, uh, recent activities noted when it comes to, to uh, trade uh, across border. And in, in large part, uh, it's being fueled by uh, increasing pressure on cost of manufacture. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we have more things, uh, we want more things, and technology, um, not, not only are we enjoying the technological things, but technology is affording us the opportunity to have more. Mm -hmm. So um, our, our demand, in, in short, continues to grow. Mm -hmm. what, what was once um, uh, limited in, in, in large part to the imagination of a very small few, so what, you know, what, what are some of the innovative things that could exist for us? Um, we have, have empowered um, an, an, a, an entire world's population to develop. Right. I think one of the, one of the more interesting uh, dynamics, and I'll digress for one moment, is the evolution of China. When I first started manufacturing in China in 1986, so most mm -hmm. certainly I'm dating myself, but I went there to manufacture ski wear. I, I began my life um, developing sporting goods and, and outdoor products and and so uh, a, a waterproof breathable fabric called Gore-Tex was relatively ah. new on the market mm -hmm. and we were having difficulty manufacturing that in Newport, Vermont <clears throat> and being able to provide a garment that, that was affordable mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, for the U.S. public and so we first went to uh, to Hong Kong and, and one year later to mainland China, mm -hmm. which afforded us the opportunity to produce that garment for one third of the cost that, mm -hmm. that we put in the United States. Um, I've been witness um, since that time to a tremendous transformation and maybe I can just highlight the stages because I think it's relevant to, to what our future with technology is going to be. China began um, its relationship with the United States as a, as a low-cost manufacturer. And, of course, I think we're all aware of the impact that it's had on, um, on branded consumer products uh, across our country. Um, very soon after, um, those factories that, that were producing at a low cost began to become partners. And again, I'm, I'm generalizing and not suggesting that, that this was the case in every instance, but a significant number of, of factories who were large volume producers entered into partnerships together with the factories. Mm -hmm. And that worked in, in the favor of, of both parties. Um, from there, the, the, the next stage saw the Chinese companies actually becoming licensees. So licensing brands that they could distribute not only in their own country, mm -hmm. uh, but also in other countries across Asia. And this, this created a, a, a power platform that China has, has built significantly on across all industry sectors going forward. But again, it, it, it largely began um, with, uh, with apparel products and, uh, and other, other consumer goods. Mm -hmm. The next step, um, the next stage um, was the Chinese um, acquiring brands, Motorola being probably the most notable. So what we remember uh, as the innovator and certainly one of the drivers behind cell phone technology, of course, with, the, with their flip phone, uh, became a Chinese company. Mm -hmm. uh, so too did um, what became Lenovo, which was the computer division of, uh, of IBM. And those, those two initiatives, I think, began to have a transformative effect on, on the Chinese people, particularly um, the Gen X generation, mm -hmm. and which has, it has had a significant spillover into the millennials because the most recent notable uh, achievement of, of, uh, of China in the development and establishment of brands, of course, is Alibaba, which has been truly transformative um, globally. And I believe um, clearly communicated to this generation the next generation of, of, of product and, and service developers gave them the, uh, the, the power. It, it enabled them by, by allowing them to understand that they could create anything. No longer 
was China, which was the, the, uh, the country of their parents, mm-hmm. um, the low cost manufacturer for the developed world. And right. instead here today, they were, they were able, they were empowered to be able to create their own brands, mm-hmm. create their own products and services that could be distributed around the world. And kind of take the lead in many cases. Well, I, I, I firmly believe that um, in the case of artificial intelligence, through their focus and attention over the last decade, mm-hmm. um, that they are in a lead position. Now, I'm, I'm optimistic um, that members of my generation, and I've been actively involved in, uh, in investing in and, and collaborating together with, with Chinese businesses and um, uh, since I began that, that initiative in, in 1986, um, I believe that that um, whilst we're we're experiencing um, a, a challenging trade and investment environment today, that there is a desire amongst mm-hmm. the business leadership in both countries to collaborate together right. in the development of and the application mm-hmm. of of, uh, uh, of technologies. And so, whilst it's not going to be simple, uh, because there are many other geopolitical factors mm-hmm. at, at play. Um, the opportunities for collaboration between the U.S. and China on technology development are, are really quite mm-hmm. significant. Right. You know, and, and politics aside, you know, which obviously is a very big thing, especially right now, um, but they're going to do it no matter what. So do we want to be part of it or do we want to be behind? Um, you know, and, and I mean, there's, there's obviously so many important issues here to, that, I mean, we could talk about that forever, but you know, it, it, it's not like they're going to stop if we say, no, no, don't do that. And you know, they're going to keep continuing. And, and so we can be part of the, the, the process or be left behind, um, you know, whether we like it or not, that's just the way it is. Um, you know, and, and you know, I, it, it's funny. I have people that say, oh, I don't buy anything from China. And I'm thinking, Oh, you have nothing in your house <laughs> and you probably don't have a house because you know some of the material I mean yeah I mean it's just there they really are everywhere for a variety of reasons you know low cost you know all sorts of things and, and again that's that's a whole different political debate but yeah, technology is here technology is going to stay and more importantly technology is going to continue rapidly making changes and advancements and we can either lead follow or get out of the way um, you know, and, and, and I, you know, being an American, I happen to think, well, maybe we should lead a lot of these things, but you know, it, it is something that we do need to do cautiously. Again, you know, are we, are we giving technology the power to do too much? Um, you know, and, and I think that's, that's a, a lot of what you talk about in your book. Well, and, and you, you asked a, a, a very there important. There were several rambling things in there. <laughs> No, but I, I think you know you you made reference earlier to to data, um, and uh, yes, uh, data is the new oil, and mm-hmm. and we are the data producers mm-hmm. with every swipe and keystroke and uh, and and um, and touch. There, we we don't have um, we don't have a uh, governor of data. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't, you know, one of the things that, you know, I think could be valuable for us to talk about is, and, and certainly an inspiration for the book, is that we don't have a global governor of technology right. that decides what we do and when we do it and how we do it. And, mm-hmm. and, um, uh, and, in, and that certainly was an influencing factor in, in developing the transhuman mm-hmm. code. Um, yes, um, we, we have been and we continue to, to contribute information um, to these platforms, and and it can be argued um, that the the codes that we rely so heavily on for searching and socializing and and shopping, and you can figure out what those are, um, that they've been developed by a select few. Mm-hmm. Um, the proposition behind the transhuman code is that. The developers, the enablers, like myself in the finance industry, and the users, which is really all of us, mm-hmm. we have to actually take charge and take responsibility for, for coding the, the future of, right. of technology. And it doesn't mean that, um, that, that I'm asking your readers and, and uh, or view, viewers and listeners to, 
and we hope readers um, to uh, to to retreat to their uh, to their study or kitchen table at the end of this conversation. And say, okay, I'm going to write the code, um, and then that's going to be applied to everything I do. What we do want everyone to consider is is what would they uh, accept as being allowable for technology in each of the areas of their ecosystem. So. We, I'm, I'm sure many of, uh, of you are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of need. Right. Um, the establishment of, of priorities and, mm -hmm. and uh, ethical protocol um, to ensure that, uh, that we're meeting our, our, our needs and that we're not allowing our, our wants to supersede them was in part a guiding principle. And so what we've done is, is identified the core elements that make up our life ecosystem, so mm -hmm. transportation communication, uh, education, uh, work, uh, money, uh, health, water, food. And we, we're sharing uh, with the readers of our book how technology uh, is influencing those elements today. We share some highlights of, uh, of, of real-world uh, initiatives, and we, we provide a glimpse into what's coming. Mm -hmm. the, the pace of technological change is so dramatic oh. that at, at the very least I think we need to be grounded in, in where we are and what's on the immediate horizon mm -hmm. and with that um, we share some questions for the purpose of starting a dialogue between mm -hmm. friends, between employers and employees, um, between co-workers, between family members about what will and, uh, and will not or should or should not be acceptable. Mm -hmm. I, I have every confidence that um, governments around the world and the Europeans are, are a little bit more advanced in, in, in data management, I think, than, than we are today, um, but that I have every confidence that a regulatory structure will be, will be clearly established that will ensure that, that your data, uh, what, what you contribute, cannot be used without your permission and where appropriate, it can't be used without your compensation. Right. That, that, that to me, I've, I've, I've been witness to, and, and certainly I'm, I'm a voracious reader of pioneering, mm -hmm. and uh, I feel very confident that that will resolve itself. Mm -hmm. what, is, <clears throat> what is more difficult to control um, is the development of technologies that, uh, that could be used for, uh, for uh, nefarious acts, um, and the, the assurance that we use technology as a social equalizer. Mm -hmm. we, we have an opportunity, we're already bearing witness to this today, but we have an opportunity to truly transform the relationship between the proverbial haves and the have-nots mm -hmm. with new technology. We have to want to do it. Uh, we have to be aware of how it can be used. We have to have the financial um, resources to be able to achieve that. But this, what's most exciting for me is the opportunity for individuals like you and I, Deb, to actually have an impact uh, on, on the life experience of, of people all over the world mm -hmm. by informing them, as we're doing today. You know, the Transhuman Code is intended to be a conversation starter, and I, I put, place so much value, and I'm so thankful for you inviting me to, to come and talk about this because you, we have the ability to actually spread the word about how important it is to have the conversation mm -hmm. and to be thinking, all of us, about how we can do more, right. how, how more social good can be realized, how we can be contributing to establishing a much, much higher level of equality. You know that, that in, in Africa alone on a year, in, in one year, African women walk over 40 billion hours a year to find fresh water, and we still have 750 million people in the world who can't access fresh right. water. Mm -hmm. we, we need to focus time and attention on this, right. uh, without question. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have to produce more food in the, next, um, in the next 50 years than we have in 10,000 years before us. And we have increasing issues concerning uh, food quality, mm -hmm. concerning food security, and concerning food distribution. Right. We, we dispose of, of over one third of the food that we produce in the United States each year. Mm -hmm. Around the world, uh, we have 800 million people um, who do not have enough food 
to experience a healthy life. Mm -hmm. Yet we have 2 billion obese people. Right. We have a significant distribution issue right now. And I know I, I, I have the ability, uh, had the opportunity to work very closely with the University of Guelph, my alma mater in Ontario, Canada. Mm -hmm. They have one of the leading food institutes in the world. And they are focused very, very intensely uh, on meeting the distribution uh, issues today, but also planning for food security and, and food volume requirements that we're going to have going forward. Right. That, though, organizations like that, uh, this is the Arel Food Institute led by Evan Fraser, those, those organizations are looking for outlets such as this to be able to share the importance of that in hopes that individuals that have a concern for and an interest in ensuring that all of us uh, are able to eat properly, responsibly, and, and safely um, are able to do so. And, and again, this is where we're going to count on, on technologies to, to bring us there. Right. You know, and, and it brings up some huge ethical conversations. Um, again, you know, just, just because we can, should we? Uh, food is, of course, one of the things that, that you know, I, I hear a lot about, you know, the, and read a lot about with, with my friends, because we are, you know, there is only a, a certain amount that we can produce. I mean, you know, we, there's only a certain amount of land, you know, all these various things. I was just in Kansas where they have had horrific storms for, you know, too long. <laughs> And the wheat is not going to grow. The corn is not going to grow. You know, all these various things. So then should we develop corn and wheat products that can survive in, in those conditions or in drought conditions? You know, all these various things. And then there are some of my friends who, or, you know, and, and associates who will say, oh, we, we should not ever tinker with that. Um, you know, we, we need to go back to the basics. And, and you know, and, and it really is, it's an interesting conversation because, you know, it is, and, and, you know, water, you mentioned, and, and this is one of the things you mentioned in the book is, you know, we have, and you just, you said, you know, so many people who just do not have clean, fresh water. And so then the problem is that they are dying because of that. Um, you know, they're either getting diseases or dehydration, you know, all these various things. And so we go, ooh, ooh, well, we'll develop the technology, but then they don't have any way to implement it. You know, all these various things. And, and so it, it's, it's not just, a, a, it's obviously a very complicated discussion. And, and I love that people really are thinking, oh my gosh, we need to have these discussions. And it can't just happen, as you said, at the very high levels. It's got to be kind of this grassroots thing where we really do start thinking about this and, and taking action. Yeah, so with, with regards to food... The, um, and it might be a, actually a, a really interesting um, idea to, to bring some of these experts to, to your audience. I think mm -hmm. Evan, Evan Fraser, who's an extremely well-respected well mm -hmm. um, uh, expert on, on, on the, the past, present, and, and future uh, of food, mm -hmm. and, uh, and he's, he's written frequently on the subject, um, the, we... we we know now that um, that not all geographies are friendly mm -hmm. um, to the foods that we need to evolve. Right. And and whilst I I, I think there is uh, there is a common positioning um, amongst food experts um, that um, modifying foods um, pure purely for the the production of more. Yep. Um, is uh, is is not um, may may not be the most appropriate way uh, for us to advance. I, I want to be sensitive to uh, right. To, yeah, just to make more money is not the goal. Making food available to to all human beings that 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 deserve that that fundamental um, basic need. Again, going back to to Maslow. Um, I, I think is where uh, some of the most dynamic technology is, is being developed today. So, mm -hmm. so <clears throat> how do we how do we get to uh, how, how how do we deliver water? Um, how do we grow food in the desert? Mm -hmm. um, how how do we how do we grow food? How do we deliver water um, in those regions that uh, that 
um, host um, members of our population, but but don't have an environment that allows us to to uh, provide those things consistently. This this is a key area of focus, um, and through that, um, we're also learning how we can be more effective, how we can be more efficient, um, and how we can be more responsible with the lands that we have uh, in the developing countries, or sorry, in the developed countries. Um, where uh, we are, uh, we are enjoying a gluttonous burden of uh, of food, of which, as I mentioned earlier, we're throwing away one third of um, each year. Right. So it, I, I, I think um, it is. It's an extremely Im important conversation to be had. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's one that um, obviously food represents a significant element of our economy. Um, it's something that we all uh, wish wish to continue to experience, and uh, together with the quest for enhanced nutrition uh, and uh, and better life experience, we know that uh, it can have an impact on our health mm -hmm. as well. Which, of course, um, is something that we're also paying very very close attention mm -hmm. to the future right. of. Right. Well, and and it's interesting because you know health is one of those those big things that because of technological advances, we now live longer, which then brings an entirely different host of issues, you know, yeah. not the least of which is just more population, um, yes. you know, and, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of these things that it, it, we really could just talk about it forever because it, it just, you know, leads to, to more and more things, um, you know, and, and it, you know, one of the big things that we've seen recently with, you know, like say the, the big drug companies is, well, they, they don't develop, you know, cures more advanced treatments because it's less expensive. You know, they're going to earn more money. Well, you know, that comes back to that ethical thing. You know, I'm sorry, if you could cure, you know, a variety of the major illnesses, I, you know, hopefully they would do that. Now, okay, we know that there are people who know they, they won't. I mean, you know, that money is, is the ultimate for them. You know, and, and, but there are also, and that I guess maybe leads us back to, it has to come at the grassroots level and, and really with people saying, wait a minute, you know, you can't charge $700 for insulin, uh, you know, and, and then things happen, um, you know, and, and that is sure. kind of where technology is advanced into it too. I mean, you know, social media, holy cow, when you have some issues like this and they spread on Twitter and on Facebook and, and all of those things, you know, those poor executives are probably thinking, what the heck? You know, this this never would have happened ten years ago, which is is true. Nobody would have ever known. And isn't that, now, isn't that great? Mm -hmm. Isn't yeah. that great? Right. So oh, yeah. listen, mm -hmm. and this is this is the awareness that that we want everyone to have. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the 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 core premise is that these conversations need to happen. Right. So, uh, we we very much want you to be informed by mm -hmm. Facebook as well as your the mainstream media. Uh, about what's happening and why, and we want more people to to say, okay, not you know, not only is this not the right thing to do when when that occurs, but what about if we were to do this? How, mm -hmm. What could the benefit be right. to the people that I know and and to the people that I, I may never meet, um, but I know could could uh, could realize a more enhanced life experience uh, if this were to occur. Right. And so this. This conversation, I think, is is so important. We we want students asking their teachers. We want parents asking school superintendents mm -hmm. about the future of education. Mm -hmm. I, I I'm particularly bullish. At, I I am less concerned uh, about our ability, um, the the uh, administrations of, of countries all over the world, to put the proper controls in place to monitor and ensure that our data is responsibly managed. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm confident with the organizations like WiseKey and DarkTrace and some of the other leaders in cybersecurity, their ability to, to ensure that our information is, is protected mm -hmm. from those that may want to access it and, and use it in, inappropriately. So I, I'm, my focus and attention, uh, my cause uh, is becoming increasingly how are we going to uh, ensure that 
uh, our youth are educated, mm -hmm. and that our employers are prepared for the transformative effect of technology. Mm -hmm. In one of the experiences that uh, I find uh, slightly disconcerting is that some of the fantastical numbers that have come out of the World Economic Forum year over year about the, the transformation and the adoption rates of technology have all fallen short of their realization. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the, the uh, number of interconnected things we missed by, by almost 50%, yeah. have almost 30 billion um, interconnected device capabilities today. Um, it, that we weren't estimated to, to be at 20 billion until um, mm -hmm. 2025. So I, I, I put great stock in, in their proclamation in their uh, end of year future of jobs report, which suggests that 125 million new roles will exist as a result of our robotics and artificial mm -hmm. intelligence. However, 75 million um, roles, jobs, uh, will be displaced. Mm -hmm. They will not exist by right. 2022. So um, obviously we, we have a, a, a question of, mm -hmm. of, you know, what are we going to do with the 75 million? How are they going to be reskilled? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm more deeply concerned about the chasm between those two numbers. So mm -hmm. we don't have a plan for the 50 million and not enough organizations uh, are planning for reskilling. Mm -hmm. I, I hosted at, at the World Economic Forum for CNBC this year a, a, a global broadcast on the future of education, and I had the I had the benefit uh, of uh, of featuring uh, global leaders um, uh, who were responsible for somewhere in the range of about one million employees. Wow! Now. These are, uh, these are progressive uh, organizations. They are very much at, at the forefront of, of technological advancement and, and are, uh, are forward thinking for the future of their companies. And, and in, in, uh, in uh, all instances, these were, were global organizations. I think over 200 companies rep mm -hmm. countries represented mm -hmm. uh, through these five organizations. The ability to um, to reskill uh, is a, a, a burden that falls on the organization itself. But in order to prepare for reskilling employees, a term that I think will become increasingly important, mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, I, I believe that, that the, the HR function, the chief human resource officer in, in, in our organizations is going to become perhaps the most powerful, the most important role in the C-suite going forward. Wow. But these these individuals have to prepare not only they have to envision what's coming so they have to be able to look one three five years forward they have to look not only internally but they have to look externally uh, they may be already disruptive in in some form within their business or and or they they may be at risk of being disrupted uh, by another organization mm -hmm. or, or multiple very very challenging time in the c suite today Right. So in order, in order to reskill, you have to be able to anticipate um, what the functions are going to be going forward. Right. You know, and One, we've, we've had to do that for years, you know, with the, the first industrial revolution. I mean, you know, we went from, you know, just doing everything by hand to having machines that would do it. Um, you know, and, and, you know, more recently in, in our lifetimes, you know, we went from basically no computers you know, I didn't, I did not touch a computer till I was in college, which, you know, that's giving my age away. So, yeah, but, um, you know, and, and so people went from writing everything, you know, so you had ledgers, you computed, you did it all by hand to having everything computerized, you know, so you had to be reskilled then you had to be taught, you know, how to use, I heard the term the other day and just laughed, Lotus one, two, three, um, you, know, and, you know, many people were like, what the heck is that? Well, you know, that's what happened before Excel. Um, you know, and, and so you had to learn these things. And so for the people who are burying their heads in their sand or going, oh, my gosh, you know, AI is bad. It's horrible. We, we have been making these steps. Now, you know, as you said, the problem is we're having to make these steps much more quickly 
than we have in the past. And, you know, and, and just big leaps. You know, it's not just, hey, you have to go from a handwritten ledger to learning Excel. It's you have to go from a handwritten ledger to programming Excel, you know, or, or, or something like that. And, and, you know, and, and, and there are people who, who won't be able to do it, but that's, that's more because, again, they're not given that opportunity. You know, they're not given that training, you know, all those various things. So, I, I, I think at, at the root of all this is something that I, I alluded to earlier, and that is that the barriers to entry for the development of technology mm -hmm. have been flattened. Right. There isn't anything, Deb, to, to stop you and I after we've finished this program today online with one another to develop an app that we could have in market in 60 days. Right. Right. Or less, and, mm -hmm. or, or, or or less. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. that that's right. If 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 we can get if we can have AI do the rest of our work, mm -hmm. then 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 we can focus solely on that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, few if any barriers to entry. Uh, for I'm, and I'm talking about the the the, the, the world at large, mm -hmm. and the ability for um, organizations to be able to pivot, to be able to transition being um, limited in, in part by their size and, and the industry uh, uh, that they're in, will continue to, to see significant amounts of disruption. Mm -hmm. Anticipating that um, it will be it will be predictable in, in some regards, but uh, but not in others. There are, mm -hmm. there are, we're almost every day I'm I'm surprised by new technological developments. The will within the organization, the, the recognition, the allowance of individuals to, to recognize that transformative change is, is upon us and it's mm -hmm. only going to accelerate is, is an important conversation that needs to happen between right. employers and employees, between mm -hmm. the leadership of, of organizations that are going to make those, those decisions. Mm -hmm. it, it takes, um, on average, within our secondary and post-secondary institutions in the United States, 2.7 years to introduce a new course into the curriculum. It's too slow. Right, oh, way too slow. <laughs> the, the, the advancement of, of, uh, of, new, of new technologies that are going to impact the, the students and what their roles are gonna be is moving 100 times faster mm -hmm. than that. So it, it, is a, it is a significant challenge that I think is best served in the short term with an approach that is going to be applicable forever. So you've heard the term life, you know, lifelong learning, lifetime learning. I, I, I think that it's, it is, um, it's paramount today that, that each of us at whatever stage of education we may, may be, and certainly as parents of, of middle school and high school students, as, as I am with a pair of, of 16 year olds, we have to be aware of, of what elements are available to us, what services are available to us, so that we can supplement the education that our institutions are, are able to offer. Mm -hmm. um, it's wonderful that, that organizations like MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, who through their media lab have been responsible for, for really driving um, uh, much of the, the transformative technologies that we're experiencing today that they have for many, many years now been making all of their curriculum available online for yeah. free. Mm -hmm. um, and there's an increasing, uh, increasing volume of, of educational uh, information course curriculum um, that's available mm -hmm. uh, online for, uh, for your viewers and, and listeners. But I, I believe that we actually even have to go further than that. And, and we have to assume the responsibility that for our foreseeable future, we are responsible for curating our own education. Mm -hmm. And that I know that if I'm going to continue to, to practice in my primary area, which is investment banking and, and financial advisory service, that I need to, I need to keep, uh, maintain awareness of, I have to apprise, I have to continue to, to evolve in order to be relevant. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I can see from my own study what the applications are. For artificial intelligence, I can see what the applications are uh, for other communication technologies that are going to impact my business. 
I've, I've made it a practice over the last three years to, to study that. And so I, I, I can see how that's going to impact myself, how it's going to impact my team, how it's going to impact uh, the, the, the company, Generational Equity, that I'm a part of. Mm -hmm. right. as, as an organization, um, um, Generational Equity, for, for whom I'm uh, executive director for m and um, we are the, the largest volume um, uh, advisor for lower middle market companies in, in the United States. Those are companies wow. with a value of under $50 million. Mm -hmm. And this, this affords me and, uh, and our team um, a very, very um, unique insight into how companies are transforming and or how they're not. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's encouraging to me is that the level of awareness for the need to, to transform, uh, I consider to be very, very high. Um, yet the, the level of, of adoption and assumption of, uh, of the tools necessary to transform is not keeping pace with the awareness level. And, and this has to change. I, I think if there's one message that I can deliver to, to everyone is that this dialogue, this, this conversation really must be now. Right. Um, we, we are, again, with, with those limited uh, barriers to entry, uh, with, with borders that we can easily uh, leap across, um, there, are, there are other, uh, other members of our global population in, in other countries that want to have um, what we have and are willing to work very, very diligently to, to get that. So mm -hmm. no longer is, our, is competition as it once was limited to, uh, to a village, to a community, to a county, to, to a state, and, and to a country. Mm -hmm. Technology, in the same way that you and I are afforded to have a, a, an, an enjoyable, relaxing conversation, being able to see each other between Atlanta and San Francisco, so too can commercial transactions, and, and they are happening from different corners of the world, from individuals with varying degrees of, of experience and expertise. Right. You know, and as you said, we see companies, whether they're smaller or large, who don't make the change. You know, and, and some of them survive, but they, they stumble along. Um, but, you know, in, in, in my world, one of the things that I see a lot of people do is they, you know, many people have never figured out you really need to have your website visible on a cell phone. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, I'm sorry, if I can't look at your website on my phone, then it's probably not going to work. You know, we were traveling recently and we were looking for places to eat and, you know, looking at restaurants and you couldn't find their hours. You couldn't find their location. They might have had a basic presence, you know, but, but you couldn't find, you know, the basic information. And so what did we do? We went to the next one on the list. Um, you know, and, and the same thing happens. I mean, that's Amazon's big premise is, you know, it's, it's easy to get the things through them. Yes. You don't have to get in your car. You don't have to go down. You know, and, and so it's fun to see the other, <coughs> their competitors figuring yeah. that out, you know, with the big grocery chains now that are saying, hey, we'll start delivering. Um, Walmart, you know, delivering all of those various things. They're doing that to keep up, you know, and, and those that don't keep up <coughs> in many cases will fail. Yes. And, and um, there's, there's, there's no, there's no question that, um, that, that powerful forces uh, are, are at work to change the face of retail. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it's an interesting challenge for us, isn't it? That right. uh, you know, I, I am an Amazon Prime mm -hmm. oh, yes. um, member, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I'm, I'm very, very appreciative of, of Amazon. They, uh, uh, they've, they've been a facilitator of, of the sale of thousands and thousands and thousands of our books in the last, mm -hmm. uh, in the last uh, seven days, six, six days, uh, seven days today. Uh, and so I'm very appreciative of that, but, but so too um, do, do I want my local independent bookstores. Right. And totally well, I, know. I want to go in and there. feel the books and see the books. Of course, and, mm -hmm. of course. I, I've, I've gotten to know, I've, I've been a customer of, of two bookstores, the Books on Common in Ridgefield, Connecticut, mm -hmm. and, 
and uh, and Little Joe's in Katona, New York. Those are my neighborhood uh, mm -hmm. bookstores, and I've Great. I've been a customer of them, but I I haven't really come to appreciate um, how challenging it is for them until I've gotten to know the proprietors Great. over the last few weeks with mm -hmm. with the launch of our book, mm -hmm. and it is it it is a challenge for us. And again, this is this is really really what's what's so important to both Carlos and I is that we be thinking about this. Mm -hmm. So how how can we thoughtfully, responsibly, but also in, in, uh, enjoyably experience technology while being considerate of, of, of humanity. And in, and in the simplest form, um, I, I don't, I, you know, I, I only want my community to, to advance positively. I don't want to lose my independent bookstore. Right. I know. Uh, I want to be able to go to that little bookstore and sit in a comfy chair. Sure. And and the you know the owner of that bookstore and the employees of, of those bookstores they're important members of my community so they're right. part of my my immediate uh, circle of, of humanity and I don't want them to be negatively impacted. Right. Um, I'm I'm uh, I'm equally conflicted, however, because I know Amazon has the power. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, influence a, a much globe more a, a, mm -hmm. a broader global audience, mm -hmm. and so my book can be made available to to everyone. Uh, in a digital form, in a hard copy form, you're right, within 24 hours, or if you're in a major metropolitan area, you can have my book in one hour. Right, right. Um, and so I, I, I want more people having that conversation. So I'm conflicted, actually. Right. I think it's a great example. Well, and that really is the, the premise of the book is, is you, and you've said the word several times, humanity. You know, we have, we, we want what we want, but we still need to keep that humanity, you know, and, and so it's great to have the technology, but it shouldn't be at the cost of, um, and it was funny because I, I shared with you before we, when we were just chatting before we started the program that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a, a you know, I, I love technology. I also love like Star Trek, you know, and, and sci-fi and, and all of those things. And, and it's always interesting when they have episodes and whether it's, you know, there really was one of the original Star Trek series. So this was back in, you know, the, the 60s, 60s, 70s, um, where they had the computer that ran everything. And it, and, and of course the problem is it was doing great until it had to deal with emotion. And, and then it just, you know, and, and it was, it smoked, you know, the little computer, it's little circuits, you know, and, and, and all of those things. And of course that is the problem is, you know, we can't, to some degree, you can kind of build an algorithm that says, well, you know, it's, it, you know, this person seems like they might be upset. Therefore we do this, um, you know, all those various things, but you know, all of that technology isn't going to do anything if we still don't have the people who are there managing it and, and controlling it. And that's, you know, that's the thing that we need to really keep in mind. Yes. You know, your, um, your, your viewers and listeners may know that, that there are two forms of artificial intelligence, at least as, in, as we describe them. Um, the, uh, there is uh, artificial general intelligence, mm -hmm. um, which, uh, which we uh, use as a term to, to describe that, which actually can, uh, approach replicating you know, what what we are and how we self-driving cars would be a great example of that. Well, uh, yes, for for core artificial in, in mm -hmm. intelligence, those those that uh, that we don't um, uh, that we don't expect to be able to to interact um, with with emotion. There's a there's a tremendous organization called Soul Machines out of New Zealand. Um, founded by the creator of uh, of the avatars for the movie of the same name, mm -hmm. who, who was inspired to to actually create using artificial intelligence personal assistance that would allow us to to do more. Mm -hmm. and again, with the purpose uh, not only of of replacing us, um, but but allowing us to accomplish more and, mm -hmm. and enjoy more in our lives. And and Soul Machines working together with IBM. Uh, where IBM Watson uh, is the brain, mm -hmm. and the, the 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 Soul Machines avatar is actually able to look at you, and mm -hmm. so I would be interacting with them. I would encourage your your uh, your listeners and viewers to go to the Soul Machines website and, and experience this firsthand. But the the avatar not only will sense changes uh, in our our voice, mm -hmm. but also changes in our facial expression. Mm -hmm. And recognize oh. mm -hmm. where where exactly mm -hmm. <clears throat> recognize um, 
how the interaction that they're having with the individual uh, is affecting that individual. Um, the uh, Soul Machines avatars are now being deployed by a number of corporations for customer service. Right. Um, and they're, they're developing um, some really interesting applications for, for personal assistance mm -hmm. that, that we think can have a very positive impact. They're available 24-7. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not judgmental. Right. They're um, obviously they, less expensive in the long run. Of, of course, yes. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think the, uh, the economics um, uh, works very favorably uh, mm -hmm. for us. So I think mo most importantly, uh, you know, what I would ask to, to leave with, with your listeners and, and viewers is that we shouldn't be afraid. Mm -hmm. um, we should always be weary. Uh, we, we, sorry, we should, not weary. Although, uh, although that, that can be sometimes a it is kind of tiring. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on, as 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 you know, I'm on day. This is day seven of a cross country uh, book tour and 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 speaking That's tour. Weary. I'm, I'm getting a little bit getting a little bit weary, but it's been tremendous to to interact with with professionals and uh, and students and uh, alike in this in this dialogue. Most importantly. We need to be aware. We need to be aware of, of, of what technologies are applicable today, are being used today, are, are in development for near-term application. And we have to ask the questions. Are there ways that those technologies can, um, can improve the quality of, of life for individuals all over the world? Mm -hmm. And are we making the right decisions? Are we doing the right things uh, at the right time that are being considerate, not only of, of the humans, and I like to distinguish between the human and humanity. You are a human, you have wants and needs. Uh, I, I have the same. Humanity uh, as a whole, I think we humans have an obligation to, to provide uh, the best possible um, uh, infrastructure and, and opportunities for, and, that, and that's truly, um, what helps me through the weariness and and, uh, and allows me to bound out of bed every day is is just how much good we can do with technology. Right. You know, and, and I think that is the, the thing to keep in mind is, you know, technology really can be used for so much good. Um, you know, we hear about the bad. We hear about, you know, Facebook selling our data. We, you know, we hear about hackers. Um, we hear about, you know, Russian intervention in, in, you know, voting. I mean, all these various things. And, and, and of course, then my little brain goes, well, wouldn't it be good if those people turned their mind to good? You know, as opposed to let's be bad, let's do good. And, you know, hopefully that, that is happening. Um, but, you know, it, it, techno it, it's here. I mean, you know, anybody who is burying their head in the sand, you know, it's, it's funny if they're, if they're not embracing technology. I guess maybe they're not watching or listening to this because they're not using it. <laughs> But, um, observation but yeah, you know, it's, it is. It, and, and so we need to, as you said, we need to be having these conversations to be talking about, okay, really, should we be doing this just because we can, should we? And, and if we do, what are the long-term ramifications? Well, I think this is, uh, this is where, where we find ourselves today is, um, is at a crossroads and, mm -hmm. Whilst we're we're witness through the headlines to some bad being done with technology, <clears throat> there are we're all enjoying many of the benefits of it, and and not only for ourselves, but most importantly for you know how, how can those of us that that are good people already um, help and and bring more social good, more social innovation to to those that don't have it. So I <clears throat> I would. Um, I would offer a challenge to all your viewers and, and listeners to think about how they can do more okay. so that more can benefit from the technology that, that they are using themselves and or are in, engaged in the development of and, or the enabling of. Great. I love it. Well, oh my gosh, you know, we really could talk about this forever because to me, this is just an absolutely fascinating subject. You know, I, I love technology. I love everything that we can do. You know, you're in San Francisco. I'm in Atlanta. We can have this great conversation, you know, but it was funny because before we, we started the program, we were talking about getting together in the real world, you know, and, and maybe that's kind of the bringing the humanity back into things, you know, and, and, and all of that. But I've having a, been having a great time talking with David Ferguson about his book, The Transhuman Code, so, David, tell people, you know, 
yes, you can get your book on Amazon. If you've got a local bookstore, go down. <clears throat> Tell them they need to carry it. Yes, um, if, they, if, if, they, if they don't have it already, they, uh, their stores can have it within 24 hours. Great. Um, I'm, I'm really appreciative of, of the fact that, uh, you know, there, there are 196,000 books published a year. Mm -hmm. Um, we were very fortunate that, uh, that ours was well received. And so you'll find it in, uh, in all of the airport stores beginning in August. Uh, you'll find it in, in Barnes and Noble. You can order it from, uh, amazon.com, target.com, walmart.com. But if you've got a local bookstore and uh, and you feel it's important that uh, uh, that they're there forever, uh, it's a great place to go and ask for it. If you need it in an hour uh, and you're in a major metropolitan area, uh, Amazon will deliver that to you. If you <laughs> want to send it to somebody else, right. um, then of course Amazon can help coordinate that for you as well. Great, but most great. most importantly, um, I, I hope you'll read the book. I, I truly believe that that all of you can be contributors to to the cause. Um, but most importantly, just start talking about it with your friends, with your family, with your coworkers. It, it's um, our, our future really depends on it, and we can just do so, so much already with the technologies that right. exist for us to, to make the world a better place. Right. Well, David, if people want to connect with you, how do they do that? Well, they can, uh, they can find me. Uh, you can find me on Twitter uh, at D.A. Ferguson. You can find me on Instagram at David uh, A. Ferguson. You can always email me at dffany at gmail.com. Great. Great. I love it. Well, and, and the book's website is transhumancode.com. Very That's easy. Right. You know, so, so, you know, I, and, and I do encourage people, whether you think this is the greatest thing in the world, or if you're thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I can't do anything. This is going to be scary. You know, I, I really do want you to, to check out this information because it is, it's very important and we can't bury our heads in the sand. I mean, you know, we just can't. Thank you, Deb. It's been a great, great pleasure to be on with you. Great. Well, I am Deb Creer. As I said, I've been having a wonderful time chatting with David Ferguson. Can't wait to do it again. And until next time, everyone have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Business Power Hour, hosted by Deb Creer. Join us next time for more real-life stories and techniques to power up your business. You've been listening to C-Suite Radio. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com. <laughs>